My name is Rob. I work on a project called Polkadot, which is a blockchain for interoperability and scalability, just meant to be sort of the next generation uh, blockchain. Uh, but in this talk, I'm going to be focusing just on that interoperability aspect, talking a bit about what interoperability is, why we want it, and how we can achieve it. So, so the next button doesn't work, uh, but I can keep talking. Um, so I would jump in to... Are you sure? Ah, this, this screen is completely wrong. But Okay, so the two sides of blockchain. Uh, there are basically two key components that go into constructing a blockchain. So the first is the state machine. And this is what you're usually interested in when you hear about a blockchain project. Um, what are the changes that are actually agreed upon, whether it's transactions, what kind of data that are stored, whether it's using an account model or something with unspent transaction outputs like Bitcoin, um, what's agreed upon, what's stored on chain. Um, so the state machine abstraction sort of encapsulates all those possible blockchain state machines that, 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 that could exist, that people want to develop. The other side of blockchain is the consensus algorithm. That's how we reach agreement on which state transitions from state A to state B to include on chain. So that would be um, an agreement between a, a permissionless set or a permission set, or uh, you know, it could be completely decentralized, it could be centralized. You can actually make a blockchain out of all of those different things. Um, as long as they fit the properties of a consensus algorithm. So one common mistake I see people make is uh, thinking that proof of work or proof of stake themselves are consensus systems, uh, where actually they're incentive layers on top of consensus systems to make them decentralized and permissionless. Um, so what is interoperability? The goal is to connect blockchains with distinct state machines and consensus. Uh, and when I say that, I also mean to support things that we haven't even thought of yet. So supporting the past, present, and future. Supporting the things that have already been built, like Bitcoin and Ethereum, or other chains. Um, supporting the present, so that's basically what we think is possible now but hasn't been built. And also the future, to support state machines and consensus systems that we haven't even thought of yet. But over the next 10 years, probably will be invented, pushing the state of the art even further, and we want those things to be integrated into an interoperability system as well. Um, so this is sort of one thing that we think would be possible with a interoperable system. So we have um, sort of this, this polka dot interoperability chain at the center. We have a private chain, which is managed by a bank, and that might coordinate balances of, of accounts of actual people. Uh, and we have the Ethereum chain, which is public, and we have a supply chain which is focused specifically on that use case of supply chain. And all of these could communicate and send messages between themselves. Um, so we would have a smart contract running on the Ethereum chain, completely permissionless, decentralized, uh, sending messages to query something like a private bank to get a, ba a balance, and also communicating with the supply chain to determine exactly where something is in its... Um, in its provenance. Uh, so to address the status quo a little bit, we have um, the fact that one size doesn't fit all uh, when it comes to blockchain. Different projects have different requirements. And trying to force everything to use a single mechanism for writing their, their state machine is not always going to work. It might be overly restrictive in terms of data formats or what kind of computations they can do in ways that actually slow down the amount of computation or work that can be done by the chain. Uh, we also see that enterprise needs aren't being met. So enterprise private chains are usually reluctant to put their stuff on the public chain to put it at the mercy of the uh, public governance. Uh, and, and what they want is usually to manage their own data but make it accessible to the public chain. So the fact is that many enterprise networks are just sort of existing in their own bubble and that information isn't, just isn't available to public applications. So, one goal of interoperability is to basically allow those private chains to exist, but also to make their data completely accessible from the public chains as determined by the private chain. So it's not at the whims of the governance of the public chain, uh, but it's still accessible. And 
right now, the landscape is fragmented. There isn't going to be one chain to rule them all, and that's immediately obvious if you look at the landscape, which is just that every, almost every blockchain project is starting its own blockchain. Um, and the only way that they can communicate right now is through centralized services, and that's really diminishing the network effect which could exist between these projects. So these are the things that we want to address. So some future benefits of interoperability would be that there's more room for specialization. Um, if you don't lock blockchain projects into a specific model for the work that they do, they're free to use whichever computation or data formats are most convenient for them, uh, most suited to the work that they're trying to do, which means that it'll actually have a higher throughput overall. We have this more powerful network effect that I discussed before, and we have seamless upgrades of consensus and governance just by um, having the interoperability framework sort of agree on what the next thing is going to look like, what the next stage of consensus or the next um, governance model is going to look like, we can upgrade it without affecting any of these sub-projects that are hooked into the framework at all. Uh, so to think a little bit beyond tokens, the interoperability of tokens is clearly desirable. And when a lot of people think about interoperability, that's the main use case that they're thinking of. How do we get tokens from one chain to another? How do we uh, do decentralized exchange in a completely trustless way? Uh, but this is actually only the tip of the iceberg. Arbitrary message passing is much more important because we can always encapsulate token transfers in arbitrary message passing. Uh, but we can encapsulate so much more, like smart contract calls across chains. So I'm on chain A, and I don't have smart contract capabilities, but I know that there's a smart contract on another chain that I'm connected to, and I can just make this message pass to it, requesting execution of the smart contract and get the result back asynchronously. Or you can go vice versa, and you can have a smart contract platform, which is by definition a little bit less efficient because it's strictly more general, uh, but it's aware of a chain that does highly focused kinds of computation for things like privacy or um, processing data for AI or IoT kind of stuff, and it can call out to that and register devices or request highly performant computation and get the result back. So interoperability kind of goes both ways. Um, so one attempt for interoperability might be federated bridges, where you have an authority set on a chain, um, which ferries messages between that and another chain. So one main problem there is what if the other chain gets reverted, or one of those chains gets reverted, but the other one doesn't? Uh, and that's a problem I'll talk about a bit in the next slides. That's a, a fundamental problem of the security of the space. Um, the other problem is proving misbehavior of authorities and slashing them. And when I say slashing, I'm talking about this economic game that we put together to incentivize authorities not to misbehave, that misbehavior should be always detectable, always attributable, and always slashable so that you can get rid of people's funds uh, when they misbehave, and that's an incentive for them always to be honest. Uh, the other problem is that you need some kind of bridge between the data formats of the connected chains. Um, so to talk about attacking weak chains, I'm talking about two chains that both have finality. So Technically, they are finalizing blocks. So a, a, a pure proof-of-work chain doesn't actually finalize anything, but a proof-of-stake system which uses a classical consensus algorithm might actually finalize stuff, and it's not supposed to be reverted. But that's really just with a specific security bound, like 3 million or 10 million, depending how much stake there is on the network. So we have this chain one on the top, and the stuff in orange is finalized, and this green block sent a message to another finalized block on chain two. But if we have this validator set on the first chain misbehave, and they would do that if they're purely rational actors, um, if they were just bribed $3 million overall. They perform a reversion of the finalized block, the finalized green block, so it's no longer in the chain, and the source of this message now doesn't exist anymore. But chain two hasn't been reverted, and the receipt of the message is really still there. So from one perspective of one chain, we have a message received that might transfer tokens, but the tokens on the source chain still exist. So all of a sudden you have this duplication, and this kind of attack is actually reasonable to try and pull off if you have uh, an attack vector which is worth more than the cost of attacking the chain. 
Uh, so our solution to that is to have a chain specifically for relaying messages. So we have one central relay chain which ferries messages between all the attached chains. Um, and you can attach chains through the governance process, uh, and one goal is that we can make this sort of hierarchical in, in the future. Uh, the relay chain validates other chain state transitions in lockstep, so you don't get this issue of one chain being reverted while the other hasn't been. And they transmit messages when they're known to be good. So slashing is also possible easily because the stake is all in the relay chain's denomination. We don't have to worry about um, trying to make a market between the denomination of stake on one chain versus another because it's all in the same unified currency. Um, so the co-validation of the attached chains um, also gives us this benefit of often pooled security of attached chains, where these chains don't actually need to have their own consensus algorithm, but they can just sort of rely on the consensus of the relay chain, which is, has a number of benefits um, for security, because they don't have to compete over security resources with other chains, uh, but it's also really useful for development, because all of a sudden, if you're a developer with a good idea, you don't have to come up with a consensus algorithm or implement one or gather security resources for it, you can just write your interesting state machine, which is probably the first thing that you cared about, uh, and plug it into this interoperability network. Um, but it's opt-in, so we can have chains that have their own consensus and bridge them. Although it is still vulnerable to the problem that I described before, uh, we would have the relay chain validator set managing external bridges to those chains with different consensus. Um, so this is a little bit closer look of the diagram that was on the last slide. So we have this relay chain at the center. We have a parachain, which is an attached chain that uh, relies on the same consensus as the relay chain. So it's part of that pooled security. And they're different shapes. There are lots of different shapes here to represent that the state machines of these chains are actually different. Uh, and then we also have a bridge to a public network like Ethereum. So all of these chains can now interoperate. The ones which have been registered with the Polkadot network even well after Ethereum already was a thing, um, and it has maybe some kind of novel innovation, but it can still communicate with an Ethereum public net or uh, perhaps a Bitcoin public network or something for privacy or whatever there is that um, people can connect via bridges. Um, so yeah, with pooled security, the key problem is that gathering security resources for a chain is difficult. Uh, you basically have to find miners or find stakers and you have to make sure that the uh, overall value of the security resources is not easily attackable. So we're even seeing that these days, which is that small um, proof of work chains are being attacked all the time because um, those big mining companies in China can just overwhelm them without any problem. Um, so they're competing over limited resources and a lot of these resources might already be concentrated. Um, so just to reiterate this point, that innovative state transitions can be embedded into the relay chain's consensus is really good thing because all of a sudden we're dealing with the aggregate of all the security gathered for all those chains as opposed to uh, the maximum. This is sort of a diagram which uh, explains that. Um, so another major challenge would be just custodianship of funds on an external chain. Uh, there isn't really a general solution yet because it sort of falls out from that problem of um, reversion of weaker chains that I outlined before. Um, and these bridges will usually require very specific behavior on the part of the relay chain validators. Uh, and handoffs to new validators are difficult, for example, if these validators are managing a multi-signature wallet on some external chain. And when there's a new validator set on the relay chain, they need to hand over the custody of this multi-sig wallet to the new set, and that might be an involved process that may not be that easy on an external chain. We also need, of course, this mitigation strategy, uh, maybe introducing some kind of special economic gain. Um, there's certain cryptographic techniques that we can use to sort of um, prevent betrayal by having the betrayers betray each other. Um, and we are looking into that, but there isn't really a general solution. Um, so, just as an example of what I mean when I say that you can integrate a private chain, it's basically integrating a parachain into the network, which uses its own consensus algorithm, but this consensus algorithm is just what has been signed off on by the private authority. So, Polkadot's pooled security is checking that 
everything included in Polkadot has been signed off on by the private network authorities, but it obviously can't produce blocks which have been signed by the private network authorities. And that means that the private network can determine exactly which data it wants to make available. It may only make sort of a manifest of what uh, changes exist or what data exists right now available without making the transitions that got us there available. Uh, and now the data would be available to all other chains on the, integrated into the Polkadot network, uh, but it would be completely managed by the private chain authorities. Um, thank you very much. Uh, if you want to check out the development of this, we've actually got it all open source uh, for the first implementation. It's being developed by Parity Technologies uh, at this GitHub URL. There's a couple other websites you can check out if you're interested in learning more about Polkadot. Uh, and if you'd like to connect, here are some Twitter handles you can shoot messages to. Um, I guess this is the time to take questions. Actually, Rob, we've kind of run out of time for questions. Okay. I'm sorry. So don't ask <laughs> you questions. You have to ask him questions later. I don't want to hear your questions. Uh, <laughs> no, you can come talk to me afterwards, and I'll answer your questions. Thanks uh, a lot. Thank you very much.